costs are on the rise. Currently, in 2019 alone, there was an estimated 410 parts per million of CO2 released into the atmosphere. This comes out to be about 7,093 gigatons of CO2. This, a gigaton is equivalent to 3 million Boeing 747 jets. So obviously, huge number. So what's the issue with that? Well, rising temperature levels has been, CO2 levels have been linked to increasing global temperature. The global average surface temperature has rose by about Seven, about 0.17 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. The, sorry. Global temperatures have been also have has been linked to sea level rising as well as lower and as well as CO2 levels increasing. Lower air quality temperature and more frequent severe weather, so tornadoes, hurricanes, and all that. The increase of sea levels could it, could displace two, two thousand, two, sorry, 200 million people uh, by the end of the, by, two, by 2100. So by the end of the decade. And ho higher ocean acidity has weakened both coral reef shell skeletons and avalanche shells. So if our coral reefs weren't dying fast enough, well, we have another reason why they can die fast enough. So obviously, there needs to be some change. So, so some of the current solutions, all cur most current solutions fall roughly under three categories: social, economic, and scientific. The Paris Agreement and EU regulations fall under political and economic. While innovations to fossil fuel, green energy, and genetic engineering all fall under scientific. All of them have their shortcomings, though. The problem, the current problem with social and economic solutions. The Paris Agreement regulate, Regulation EU 2019-631, the Tokyo Protocols, and also documents signed by the People's Republic of the Maldives, all aim to reduce CO2 emissions in their countries. They all do this by a very, very different means. EU regulations usually give economic incentives to companies, so they'll go to, let's say, Volkswagen, and they'll go, listen, we will, we will advertise your cars more if you give them a certain CO2 threshold that they hit. As well as they give country as well as they give country members of the EU certain quotas of CO2 they can hit. Anything over that they will get hit with a fine from the EU. All of these are great at reducing emissions but not reversing the effects of CO2. Innovations made in fossil fuels have led to their increase led to an in continued and increased use. As we, even though more energy is being produced by green energy than ever today in the US, we are still heavily reliant on fossil fuels, mainly natural gas. The reason why we use natural gas instead of something like coal is because coal isn't as clean of a burn. But, because, but we have made coal, we have innovated both coal and natural gas to such an extent that they're seen as cleaner than they were 100 years ago. But because more countries are using them, it's relative, it's offsetting the gains made by those innovations. If that wasn't bad enough, we have to then deal with the politics of these. You may laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Problems with current politics, the problem with politics, a lot, but anyway. <laughs> All right, one of the biggest hurdles that needs to be overcome is the politics of fossil fuels. In, two, in, two, in 2020, 30, 39 million U.S. dollars was given to the Republican Party and 7 million U.S. dollars was given to the Democratic Party in lobbying. The greatest, the greatest recipient of that money, our beautiful President, our beautiful uh, President Donald Trump here, who received the most. He also then decided to back us out of the Paris Agreement, which again before was meant to lower CO2 emissions in certain countries. The problem with green energy is that reusable energy sources can't hold enough energy to be completely reliant on them. The most widely used method of storage is lithium ion batteries. One of the, the best lithium ion batteries we have, you hold about 100 watt hours per kilogram. The US energy consumption in 2020 was about, was 3,000, it was 3,802 
terawatt hours. That works out to be about 3.02 times 10 to the 15th watt hours. This means that we would uh, this means that we would need about 3.802 times 10 to the 13th power of one kilogram lithium ion batteries. For context, that is more than half the weight of the moon. So, a solution I decided to implement to combat all of these is genetic engineering slash genetic energy. Now, this is about to get a bit complicated, so we'll ease into this. We'll talk about something that we all should know, phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is the stuff that you look at, at, at over the seas and you see all that green stuff over there, that's phytoplankton. Its most common form is green algae. If we, if we use that common algae to genetically genetic engineer it, to increase the amount of CO2 it absorbs, this could help offset but this could help offset the effects of CO2 on the atmosphere, on our planet in temperature. The reason why we would use phytoplankton is that it is small, it's easy to grow, and they have short lifespans. The versatility of different types of phytoplankton is the greatest advantage. If I have a forest, I have trees, and nothing but trees grow. If I have a grassland, I have nothing but grass growing. Phytoplankton just needs a surface of water, and it grows. So, whoops. So, how is this possible? The, the, the use of genetic engineering, we would, we would be able to get the phytoplankton the traits that we want. The, what we would want phytoplankton to do is produce an, uh, produce an enzyme out of the en enoyl COA carboxylate, sorry, carboxylate or sl slash the reductase group, or otherwise known as ECR. Whatever ECR we would use would replace ribulose bisphosphate carboxylate oxygenases, or are you? E I S C O, Rubisco. One of them could be archaeal and oil C O A reductase, or A E O. The way we would do this is through a system called CRISPR. CRISPR was discovered in it was discovered in 1987. CRISPR is a system used to genetically modify living organisms. The way that CRISPR works is that you have, the, the way that CRISPR works is you insert a strand of DNA into a bacterium that has the Cas9 protein. That Cas9 protein will then identify that DNA strand, find the traits that you want, split it into its form, and split it into RNA, and then match it with the organism's DNA. This gives it traits that we would want it to eat. The reason why we, we, we would want to use ECR in place of Rubisco is because also, that right there is an actual model of that. Not that process, but of the actual model. The reason why we want to use that is because, as you can tell, ECRs are a lot simpler and a lot easier to implement. It is a better CO2 adapter than a The reason being for that is that ECRs have a group of amino acids that have Four amino acids that makes it better at binding CO2 faster because there's less water at the reaction site, the, the reaction site which will stop the reaction, or the binding, and it doesn't allow oxygen to bind as easily as CO2, which is what happens in the physical. These amino acids are N81, F170, F170, E171, and H365. Now, Babisco is found specifically in the Calvin cycle. See, I don't fit. It's the start. This part is the carbon association process. This is where CO2 is combined with is refined with Babisco to make to make two two one three five this bisphospho glossary. Sorry. <laughs> this, the way that this process works is it uses, the, it uses ATP to then create sugars, and then it repeats the cycle yet again. So it's the way that plants use the ATP to get sugar, to get actual sugars. 
Fine. As any, there's, as of, of course, in any solution, there are drawbacks. What are they? Well, the major drawback for most, C, for most GMO projects are government regulations, but it is government regulations and the cost of, and the cost. But there is also a heavy stigma against the, against the use of GMOs. Let's go over those one by one. Cost of regulation. Cost of regulation. The cost of the cost of GMOs is proportional to the amount of regulations there, that if the amount of tests that has to go. Tests uh, regulation tests come from multiple department department agencies. Two uh, two of those the U.S. department agencies would be the USDA AMPHIS, or the U.S. Department of Agricultural Animals and Plants Health Inspection Service. Health Inspector Service, sorry. <laughs> and the FDA Food and Drug Administration. For our, for, our, for our purposes, we would be releasing this phytoplankton into the wild. So it would be under the direct, it, it would be under the direct uh, guidance of the US, USDAA PHIS. They will be. They were the ones who will conduct tests to see if it will be safe in nature and will make and will work properly after a certain amount of uh, cycles. The reason why that the reason why you have to use a kind of a graph like this is because it's because the cost fluctuates proportional to government between governments, countries, and even state level groups sometimes. This means that this means, usually though the rule of thumb is the bigger the more impactful the trade the more likely the more the more likely the cost will increase because there's more testing that needs to be done on something that hasn't been done so something like this would be a relatively costly exper experiment due to the fact that it hasn't it, it, this is pretty recent technology and has just been discovered five years ago. And there's public stigma against GMOs. Even after multiple tests have been shown to, that they are as safe as their non-GMO counterparts. The reason that the reason is because the GMOs are relatively new technology and they're difficult to understand. The stigma, the stigma against GMOs has, has led to multiple has led to multiple court cases and also their boycott. boycott. An example of this is when is when to combat the to combat the problem of cross pollination between non GMO and GMO sources was terminator seeds, which basically means you can't re harvest seeds because they'll be sterile. This prevents cross pollination, but led to a boycott of their product, but led to a boycott of the company who was doing this because it required farmers to get new seeds every year. Combating these drawbacks. One of, the most, one of the ways that we could combat, combat most of these drawbacks is to have the GMOs be more widely used. The more that we use GMOs, the more it will become understood in the English language. It will become more understood in general. Same way that in 1920, we didn't really understand what a car was, and then all of a sudden now we have cars that are innovative to unimaginable levels. Another way is to focus on more screening tests. The more screening tests that we do, the more we, the more data we can collect on what these GMOs could do, and what certain traits would impact what certain animals as well. An increase in reporting on GMO products could go a long way to help to help people understand what GMOs are, their impact, and how they could help us in scientific discovery, and also could lead to an increased funding from the government if people advocate for it. Any questions? Do you know how much land would be necessary to like be used, or how much water surface would be necessary? Because obviously, like going back to politics, there are going to be countries that don't necessarily want to implement this, so there's kind of have, have to be more land to counteract for that. Um, I don't know the specifics of this, but for like testing wise, uh, what you could do is basically you could set up certain designated test areas. Uh, that would have isolated growth, so that it's not immediately just thrown out into the wild with zero testing. So we could gather that data on how much it multiplies and what it can do. Any other questions? Mr. Morrell. Can you your model a little bit more? Uh, 
What exactly do you want to see about it? It's kind of hard to see where it is. I was about to say, I mean, I can pass it around in this box. That works. So this is just your regular old CO2. And this is the Vibisco, this is the Vibisco mo molecule. <laughs> Any other questions? I've already seen it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, you have your magnets. You have your special sauce that you made with this enzyme. Okay. What do you do with it? I mean, how do you, do we, do we spread it in the ocean? Do we mix it in our reservoirs? What do we do? So. That is the part where the government agency would most likely decide how we would implement this into the wild. Um, I, I personally do not know how it would be implemented. Uh, it definitely wouldn't be go everywhere at once. It would probably be very slightly added to certain water sources or even if the government goes, this is great, but it's too dangerous. They could have it isolated in like greenhouses. And so if you've done any calculate, you know, whatever, so, okay, in order to take out one part per million in Oneonta, I need to spread this over basically the whole city. I mean, I'm just, do you have any idea on that kind of, that, what, what you need to do to get this working? Um, I don't, I, 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 I don't know the specifics, but I do know that currently, worldwide, 50 to 95% of the oxygen and CO2 is taken out of the atmosphere by biodegradable sources like phytoplankton. And the ECR that we would be most likely adding, which is a, uh, AER, has an increase of has an increase of 90% uh, carbon dioxide rate. So, I, as in other words, it's 90% as of, it's 90% more effective. So going on that 90% more effective, what would be say where it should be introduced into certain ecosystems, whether it's reservoirs, oceans, has there been any study done, how much would that alter or upset the existing ecosystem? What are the repercussions? What other um, uh, animals, plants, fish, whatever, would be affected by altering that ecosystem? There has, there, there, I haven't looked into that personally, but I do understand that algae is one of is a very important thing to ecosystems, and it's very uh, it's a reliable food source for many plants and animals. So there is a need to kind of keep that algae alive and growing. And as I mentioned before, ocean acidity levels are rising, and that could theoretically also kill off algae because, again, not every type of algae can survive in salt or fresh water. So if this genetically modified algae were introduced into an ecosystem and uh, other organisms or animals that would consume that, what would be the effect of them consuming a genetically modified algae versus the natural algae? So for what I'm purely focusing on, uh, I, it would not affect it enough that there would be a substantial notice because this is just a very small enzyme and a very small process and a very small process of photosynthesis. So there, and of course there would be tested, the, the reason why it has to go through these government agencies is to make sure that if we feed this to a fish, it won't grow a legs and start talking French. So there are, so, the, so that would most likely be tested at some point. There, there's multiple levels of testing. Uh, it goes from local and then it starts growing. So, so what it would most likely be is like, the first set of tests would be, can it grow in like small lakes and stuff? And then they would so go, okay, how does it affect the fish? How does it affect the frogs? How does it affect everything that would normally interact with this algae? So how much testing over what amount of time would you need to make sure there aren't any unintended consequences mm -hmm. from introducing this to an ecosystem? Say 20, 50, 100 years from now, would it genetically modify the DNA of, of anything else unintentionally? And again, I, I can't say for 100% certainty uh, it will or it won't. But the, uh, get, uh, but these tests would be um, uh, it would be conducted and completed in such a way that it would be an ongoing process. It's not I introduce a GMO and then the government just kind of leaves it. Uh, for a timeline-wise, it depends. 
because there is, because again, the scientific consensus on GMOs is continually changing. So you may have one group of scientists who's doing an experiment and they go for five years and they go, oh, this was fine. But then the next guys who were also doing it for like 10 years go, wait, hold up, we gotta back up. And that can derail everything. So it really depends on, again, what government you're doing it with. Like I just gave the USA because I mean, that's where we live. But it, it, it may depend. Like the French government may do it and they find something completely different than the English government does just because uh, yeah, have you looked into the use of algae for biofuels at all? Um, I have not. My father did, in fact. Uh, <laughs> he, he called me out and he was just like, is this what you were trying to do? And I go, no, this is something completely, well, not completely different, but it is not, in fact, what I was attempting to do. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you, Bill. We do need to move on to this point, so.